Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Calderdale and Kirklees Joint Health Scrutiny Committee. Um, I'd like to um, welcome some uh, new members. We have uh, Councillor Uppall from Kirklees and Councillor Barnes from Calderdale. And I wonder if the committee would just like to uh, I introduce themselves uh, quickly for uh, members uh, viewing through the webcast, please. So if we start with Councillor Hutchinson. Uh, Councillor Colin Hutchinson from Skirkert in Calderdale. I'm vice chair of this committee. Uh, Councillor Munro. Hello, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Councillor Munro. I represent Almondbury Ward uh, Kirklees Council. Thank you. Councillor Swift. Councillor Swift, you're on mute. No, that's it. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm Councillor Swift. I obviously haven't got some round the mule button yet after a couple of years. <laughs> and I represent Town Ward in Calderdale. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Uh, Andrew Cooper, I represent the Newsom Ward. Uh, I'm a Kirklees Councillor. Councillor Mike Barnes. Uh, morning, Mike Barnes. Um, I represent Skirkett Ward in Calderdale, where actually the uh, uh, the hospital sits. Okay, Councillor Rupal. Good morning. I'm I'm Harpreet, and I represent the Ashbrow Ward in Kirk, Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got apologies from Councillor Blakeborough from Calderdale. And uh, I'm Councillor Liz Mage, uh, Chair of, of the panel as well from Kirklees. OK, um, it is it just seems an awful long time that we have been scrutinising this reconfiguration. Um, and I wondered um, if we ought to just before we start touch base with the revised terms of reference that we've got. Um, I, I wondered if that might be uh, useful. So as a reminder, uh, the committee uh, is to review the revised proposals to include the strategic outline case, the outline business case, full business case, and assess the clinical and financial sustainability of the proposals. If required, we scrutinise the pr revised proposed service reconfiguration and its impact on patients and public. To require the commissioners to provide information about the revised proposed hospital and community based service configuration, and where appropriate, to require attendance of representatives from relevant organisations. To prepare a report for the Calderdale and Greater Huddersfield CCGs, or as it is now actually the Kirklees CCG, Calderdale Council and Kirklees Council, setting out the matter reviewed, summary of evidence, list of participants, and an explanation of any recommendations on the configuration. To receive the CCG's formal response, to take any reasonable steps to reach agreement if there are disagreements and to report to the Secretary of State if the committee is not satisfied uh, with the consultation on the revised with the, uh, with the consultation with the committee on the revised proposals and to report to the Secretary of State if we consider the revised proposals are not in the interest of the health service in Calderdale and Kirklees. So those are the terms of reference. So we need to, in the first instance, review the revised proposals to include the SOC, the outline business case, the full business case, and assess the clinical and financial sustainability of the proposals. All right, I just thought that would be a helpful reminder. Um, Right, OK, so um, minutes of previous meeting then. We uh, have the minutes of the meeting on the 19th of March. Do the committee who were present at that time, do we agree those minutes? Thank you. And um, do are there any matters arising? I think there is a list at the end of the, of the minutes, um, a summary of... Um, information that we would like and today we're looking at the business cases and the community capacity and obviously which includes care closer to home and um, um, uh, future uh, meetings it will be the carbon impact the travel etc and I've forgotten to put my phone on mute my apologies um, and um, the Yorkshire Ambulance Service as well okay 
All right, everybody okay with that? Yeah, thank you. Any interests uh, that councillor wish, councillors wish to declare? Councillor Swift? Um, yes, I serve on the Governor's Committee for the Trust. It used to be the membership one, but now it's called the Governor's one. Okay, thank you. Any other interests to declare this time? No, if you find that you need to declare interest at any time, uh, the usual procedures apply. Um, all items are in public today and uh, the meeting is being uh, webcast. We now move to deputations and petitions and I believe we've got Rosemary who is going to read two deputations uh, this morning. Rosemary? Hello, thank you. Shall I proceed? Yes, if you would like to introduce yourself and um, and um, you've got you know you've got five minutes for for each deputation. Each yeah. one. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Rosemary Hedges. I'm speaking today on behalf of Calderdale and Kirkley's nine 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 call for the NHS. Uh, I'm a former employee of the NHS and a long-term campaigner, uh, and this is my deputation. Um, in order to allow the strategic outline case to proceed, one of the requirements of the Secretary of State was for the clinical commissioning groups to demonstrate how increasing care closer to home in the community services uh, would allow um, or would lead to reduce A&E attendances um, and cut acute hospital bed days. Um, the CCGs promised to show evidence of this, uh, but finally, after almost three years of promising that data was available, in fact, they now claim that there is no such data. They blame COVID-19 and they claim that comparative data only exists up to 2019 stroke 20, and therefore can only and only partially reflect community developments that were already underway at the time of the 2018 review. We are therefore unlikely ever to be able to demonstrate a robust causal link between the increased and redesigned capacity in the community and changes in secondary care demand. We think this is a cop-out. Our Freedom of Information report presented to the March 2021 scrutiny meeting would suggest that the CCGs haven't known how to measure the effectiveness of the shift of hospital service into, into the community in reducing A&E attendance and unplanned hospital bed days. The 2018 McKinsey Modelling and Hospital Capacity report which the CCGs misleadingly call an independent review, proposed metrics for just this purpose. But we wonder if the CCGs ever got round to deciding what outcomes to measure. When we asked about their use of the McKinsey metrics, the governors obfuscated. They said, please note that the evidence base for the impact of integrated care tends to be based on whole system changes which cannot easily be disaggregated and sized. We dispute the CCG's claim that the 2018 McKinsey Hospital Capacity Monitoring Report is independent. This global management consultancy company has been shaping the NHS in its own interests and that of its corporate clients since Alan Milburn was Blair's Secretary of State for Health. As The Guardian reported in the year 2000, Alan Milburn secretly created a unit of outside professionals to work full-time within the Department of Health and drive forward the Blairite revolution in healthcare delivery for the NHS. Richard Murray, a health economist at McKinsey, who is now the King's Fund's chief executive, was part of that unit. In 2008, following the bankers' crash and the government bailout, the new Labour government asked McKinsey to come up with a plan to cut NHS spending. It obliged, with its 2009 report, achieving world-class productivity in the NHS. 
the coalition government promptly put it into effect in 2010 as what was called the Nicholson Challenge to cut £20 billion of NHS spending by 2015. This drove the, friend, the NHS into a frenzy of cuts, closures and shedding staff. That's the end of my deputation. I'll carry on now with Jenny's. Among the recommendations was the Calderdale and Huddersfield Right Care, Right Time, Right Place proposal, completely aligned with McKinsey's world-class productivity suggestion of savings of between 2.7 billion and 4.1 billion from a shift in the management of care away from hospitals towards more cost-effective out-of-hospital alternatives. At the October 2019 meeting of this scrutiny committee, we questioned the accuracy of the 2018 McKinsey Modelling and Capacity Report on the basis of information given to us by doctors in South East London and NHS campaigners in Devon. Both groups challenged McKinsey's claims in the modelling report that their local their local NHS and social care systems have made the biggest reductions in unplanned hospital admissions in England. The campaign has also pointed out the damage to the local NHS patients and their families that such cuts had caused. <clears throat> Nothing in the recent update has changed our view that implementation of the hospital's reconfiguration plan would constitute a misuse of public money and failure to provide the best value service that is fit for purpose. The update reports big additional investment in increasing community and primary care capacity in Calderdale and Greater Huddersfield. But there is nothing to counter our finding that the April 2019 strategic, strategic outline case, economic case, is biased and misconceived. In their Freedom of Information response, Calderdale Clinical Commissioning Group told us the strategic outline case provided data about savings resulting from the substitution of care closer to home services for hospital service. As far as we can see, it doesn't, and the update doesn't either. They say the increased and redesigned capacity in the community has mitigated the impact of demographic growth on non-elective emissions between 2017 and 2020. But this is scant reassurance when the Royal College of Emergency Summer to Recover report says the pandemic has shone a brighter light on emergency department system failures and calls for safe restoration and, and expansion of bed capacity above pre-pandemic levels. We know from social media messages from the CCGs and CHFT that our A&Es are overloaded and barely coping. What will happen when there is only one blue light A&E for both Greater Huddersfield and Calderdale? We can't see any good outcome. And the update says nothing about care closer to home, mitigating the impact of demographic growth on A&E attendance which is forecast to increase by 2%, 2% yearly. There is much talk of learning from the pandemic, but the most glaring lesson is that the UK is horrendously under-equipped with hospital beds and ICU capacity, and that primary care is also seriously under-resourced and in crisis. GP Online recently reported that PCN, Primary Care Network, Clinical directors are facing burnout and struggling to develop their networks, with nine in ten reporting higher than expected workload and concerns that additional roles staff brought in to support practices have yet to reduce workload. It is impossible in these circumstances, we believe, for the scrutiny committee to assure the Secretary of State that the Calderdale and Kirklees Care Closer to Home programmes provide evidence to show that planned hospital capacity is safe. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you for that. Um, 
Right. Okay. Um, can I just, before we move on, can I just, uh, just quickly go back to the minutes? Um, there is an amendment. Um, the space is in the car park. Um, I'm state thinking this is at uh, CRH. Uh, we was. Uh, 1,300, and it should be circa 1,300. Okay. Right then. Uh, so public questions. Um, we don't have any public questions. Um, uh, so we move on to item six, the update on reconfiguration of hospital services uh, at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust. Okay. Um, so... A report has been submitted um, and um, if uh, mem uh, attendees uh, from, we've got attendees from the CCGs and CHFT here today. Um, so if you would like to introduce yourselves um, when you speak, that would be really helpful, please. Um, who is uh, leading off? Uh, Anna, is it yourself or Nicola? Nicola. Nicola that's going to lead off. Nicola. Thank you Chair. Good morning everybody. My name is Nicola Bailey and I'm the Reconfiguration Programme Manager from CHFT. The purpose of the report that we've shared with you for today's meeting is to provide the panel with a further update in relation to the Reconfiguration Programme timeline, the structure and content of the business case documents and an update on the engagement undertaken during 2021. So when we last updated you in March this year, we were in the process of engaging on the development proposals on both hospital sites. This engagement period concluded at the end of March 2021. The engagement was delivered through a variety of mechanisms and was well publicised, with letters and leaflets being distributed to more than 1,000 local households and businesses nearest to each of the hospital sites, so more than 2,000 in total as well as coverage in uh, local and regional media outlets. Virtual meetings with local political and community stakeholders took place, as well as with our own colleagues, providing an opportunity for them to hear about the development proposals and for us to receive feedback from them. There was also a particular emphasis placed on engaging with seldom heard groups and those who are digitally excluded. So we made materials available in other languages printed and sent copies of materials to residents without internet access, discussed the plans on the telephone and via email, and promoted the engagement at both hospital sites. During the engagement, we analysed the quality monitoring and proactively targeted contact with groups who were underrepresented. There were over 300 formal responses received in total across both sites, providing feedback on the development proposals, and we have sought to incorporate the feedback received during this engagement into the proposals. This engagement therefore meets and exceeds the requirements laid out as part of the National Planning Policy Framework, the Localism Act, and both Calderdale Council and Kirklees Council's Statement of Community Involvement. Also within the paper, you'll see there's an outline timeline for the key milestones within the programme. And in summary, the planning application for the development of a new A&E on the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary site was submitted in mid-June. The planning applications for the developments at Calderdale Royal Hospital were submitted at the end of July. And work is now underway to develop the business cases, which will be complete by November this year. So subject to planning approval, construction work on the new A&E at Huddersfield will commence by the end of this calendar year and is due to be completed in 2023. Construction of the new car park at Calderdale Royal Hospital will commence next year and will be complete in 2023 when work will commence on the clinical development at Calderdale Royal Hospital with a completion date of 2025. As mentioned earlier, work continues on developing our business cases, which we're aiming to have complete by November. And the paper that's been shared outlines the Treasury Green Book five case model, which is the format required for all business cases. And within the paper, I've given a brief description of each of the five sections to give an understanding of the content of each section. So in conclusion, the panel are requested to note the programme update and timeline, including the details of the business case document structure, and note the process of involvement of public, 
and colleagues that's informed the proposed developments at Calderdale Royal Hospital and Huddersfield Royal Infirmary and are now subject to um, planning consideration. So I'll pause at this point uh, for questions and comments um, and obviously we'll invite colleagues that we've got um, with us to answer some of those specific questions if necessary. Thank you. Nicola, thank you for that Nicola. Can you, before I just bring other councillors in, can you just clarify one point for me? Your business cases are submitted by November and you said construction by the end of the year. Where is the timeline for the decision process? So between your submitting your business cases and construction, presumably you have to have approval for those business cases. So where what is that timeline there for that? decision please just so that we know because scrutiny will also have to follow those timelines if we if for any report that we want to put together and recommendations okay thank you so yes you're right those those business cases will be subject to approval and there will be a process um to follow we're obviously already in regular um contact with the regulators and the department in terms of our progress and the regular program updates as as we give into this meeting here um so those conversations those early conversations have already started and commenced around some of the aspects of the business case but you're right they will be subject to um, formal decision and approval before works can commence. Um, some of the things that we are planning on the site are what we will need to do in advance of any construction works around enabling works and so some of that planning work is, is happening now. Okay thanks. Um, it would be useful if you keep us updated on those decision timelines please. Right I'll bring in for questions then Councillor Mike Barnes. Um, Chair, before I actually ask the questions I've got, um, I'm not sure that answered your question because you asked for a time frame and timelines and we got nothing. We just got conversations were taking place, but we actually didn't get anything concrete in terms of time frame. So can actually do you have concrete time for timelines? Anna? Um, just to come in on that, in the dialogue that we're having with um, NHS England and Department of Health, we're aware that um, our business cases will have to go to a, a national joint investment um, committee for decision making. Their meetings are scheduled um, at regular intervals throughout the year at monthly intervals, so provisional dates are available to us in the autumn period, subject to our satisfactory conclusion of those business cases, that those could be timetabled into those meetings. Okay. But 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 the report sorry, but the report is being finalized in November. But that's in term autumn, well that's I suppose that's not I wouldn't classify November as the autumn. And then if you want to build by the end of December, uh bearing in mind December is normally about a two week month for most for, for most people in regard to when, when people start finishing. I'm I'm just a bit I'm I'm just a bit unsure that of the time frames of being fully um mapped out. So in, just if I may come back on that, in terms of the decision making process um, for the proposed um, build of a new A&E department at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, we are looking uh, to have conclusion and approval of our business cases prior to the end of the calendar year to allow us to commence construction. Um, that is for the build of the new A&E at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. In relation to the build and construction at Calderdale Royal Hospitals, we do expect that that period of decision making will take take a longer period of time, given that the level of investment there is a larger scale investment. We have had agreement with our regulators that we've previously advised into the committee that there's recognition of the need for us to make investment into the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary as early as possible to mitigate the existing estates risks and challenges that we have. So our planning process is to complete our business cases through our internal mechanisms to allow us to make full submission for those to be for that for the for the business cases to be considered and go into the decision making process by our regulators in November and we're looking for decision prior to the end of the calendar year on the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary build from our regulators. Uh, Chair, I'm only going to comment that I think that's rather tight. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, very tight. Um, yeah. And there is there is no fat if if 
if it's not approved or there are questions coming back, but 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 thank you for the answers. Um, can I can I unless yes. if we've closed yeah. one off, can I move to my specific question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I have I have two things. Firstly, you, you, Nicola, you mentioned that the number of respondees met the criteria, various criteria that you listed, about three or four t different types of criteria, um, uh, one of which was Calderdale. Do, do you know whether the responses met the individual criteria? So, for instance, you may have only got five responses from Calderdale and 295 from Kirklees. Um, do you know the split between them and did the split meet, the, meet those various requirements? Yeah, so the, the split of the formal responses I referenced um, earlier, over 300, there were 167 responses received from um, the Huddersfield site and 142 received from the Calderdale site. Um, and we did um, fully assess and analyse the responses in terms of where those responses came from, were they local residents, were they members of staff, were they local business owners, um, and all the standard um, equality monitoring and demographic information to understand that we had um, a sufficiently represented response rate. But, so, but yeah. you, you, met, you made a comment that the, there was a, a, a specific Calderdale um, criteria to pass. Did, did, what, did that 142 pass that? Yes. Thank you. OK, the other question I've got on that ba on this basis uh, um, uh, is that there were residents, local residents within uh, the Skirkett Ward, which where the hospital sits, were promised a meeting uh, in order to go through the plans. And I'm fairly sure well, I, I know at least one resident who didn't respond because they were waiting for that meeting. Did those meetings take place? So the way we engaged for the um, with all stakeholders, including local residents, was all done digitally. It was all done virtually in terms of the the meetings like this environment where we would share share proposals and receive feedback. But all local residents were uh, did receive a letter. Um, the nearest 100 residents received a letter. Um, giving them information as to how they could contact us if they couldn't access the online portal to view the plans. And but, they also received a, a leaflet. OK, but you did that letter promise meetings to be held? No. Well, I, I, I have a number. I have at least what I, I have a number of residents who believe that a meeting, a physical meeting was being held and held back on response until that meeting, because these were elderly residents who have no access to um, uh, digital uh, means or virtual virtual meetings. So they they were under the impression from that letter that a actual physical meeting was being held where they would be shown the plans. No, unfortunately, due to the restrictions around COVID and the time during you know March this year when we were in uh, national lockdown, we we never developed plans to hold any face to face meetings, which is something we would have done pre pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, will you be able to send me a copy of the letter that was sent out to the local residents, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. I mean, certainly a, a comment with the timescales that have just been outlined. We will need to be very um, sort of adroit at getting at convening uh, the uh, joint committees um, around the time that there is something to scrutinise. Mm -hmm. But we have been informally uh, advised that uh, sections of the uh, f the full business case for Huddersfield, the, the uh, outline business case for Calderdale, would be made available to us before the whole report was com was completed, and it would be nice to hear when we might start seeing some of these some of these sections some of these sections and obviously some of them are, are more of, of greater concern to us than than others um, regarding the planning application for um calderdale royal you said it was submitted in mid, mid mid july but i've looked on the planning portal and i can find no trace of it having been uploaded to the planning portal so that residents might be able to comment on that um, is the is that purely an internal Calderdale Council's um, sort of delay, or are there other reasons that that might be? I can answer that point. Is that okay, Chair? 
So the um, the planning applications for the Calderdale Royal Hospital site were submitted at the end of July, so very recently. Um, and so they are now um, going through the council's validation process. So they'll be in the process of being uploaded onto the portal, but they're probably not there just yet. Um, although the, the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary ones are obviously on their portal because they were submitted slightly earlier. So it's just a timing. Thank you. Anna, did you want to come in at all? No, OK. Uh, Councillor Rupal. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, hi, Nicola. I just wanted to ask about the, um, the engagement process, uh, just to follow up from Mike. Um, you said, obviously, most of it had to be done digitally because of what was going through, uh, what was happening with COVID. And understandably, a lot of organisations ha had to look at a different footing for engagement um, and consultation but do you feel the engagement was robust enough for those who don't have access to digital means i know you said that some letters and leaflets were sent to the nearest 100 households i think you said um that feels quite limited for t to me to, to say 100 um so i'd just be like to get your views and how robust you felt it for the for, for those who didn't have digital means uh, particularly for some older people as, as Mike has mentioned there as well and the other question I just wanted to quickly ask was um, you've submitted the planning application for HRI um, A&E in June and do you have any timelines for when uh, officers are going to be assessing that or when it goes to committee um, as of yet? Thank you. OK, thank you. So I'll, I'll take the answer to those questions in the order you asked them. So in terms of the um, the engagement, um, you're right, we were um, a little limited in terms of how we could reach out to people. But from the outset, we were really, um, really clear we wanted to make that as um, accessible um, to local residents, our own colleagues and members of the public and patients as possible. Um, so we did do a significant amount of work um, to understand how we could how we could expand that reach as far as possible. So we did distribute 100 letters to the nearest residents on both sites, but also a thousand leaflets to the nearest residents, businesses, community groups, um, education establishments um, on both sides. So um, in excess of 2,000 um, printed mail outs to the nearest residents of both sites. We also promoted the engagement um, within our hospital facilities themselves with posters and banners. We obviously um, promoted the engagement within, within our own colleagues, but in terms of external, there was quite a lot of media um, uh, press releases and media sharing of the engagement, which I think also helped um, to, to spread the, an awareness of the engagement. And in response to you, your question about um, how robust do we feel that was and how confident in the responses, we did receive um, a number of um, contacts. So we gave a, a telephone number as well as an email address and a postal address. Um, and we received um, contact from local residents through all those means on both sites, uh, which helped inform um, the feedback. And they were collated in the same way that anybody who put um, feedback through the online portal uh, was obviously collated and analysed. So we feel that um, throughout that process and also the equality monitoring that we did throughout the period to test whether we felt we were getting the reach we needed across the local populations, we do feel that that was a real robust engagement. Um, in terms of the, the second point, the planning applications uh, uh, for the Huddersfield A&E went in, you're right, in the uh, middle of June. And um, whilst we're still waiting to hear a final um, date for consideration by the panel, we are hopeful that that will be before the end of September. So, okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Swift. Ah, got it right. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether it should come under this because there's another item I could put it under. But I believe that either the maternity unit or the birthing unit um, is opening again in Kirklees. And I just wondered whether that was permanent, temporary, or we're already in a state of not knowing what we need for this reconfiguration. Thank you. 
Anna, is it yourself? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. So um, you'll know Councillor Swift and, and uh, other members of the panel that during the pandemic, we did need to make some changes in our provision of services in our response to the pandemic. And that included a temporary closure of the birthing unit at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. We are very pleased that we now have um, been able to uh, reopen on the Huddersfield site, the birthing unit. That is a permanent decision. The decision to reopen the unit is, is on the back of a, a, a clear commitment around the importance of us continuing to provide that option for delivery and birth in Huddersfield. Um, so yes, it, it's, a, it's a commitment for that continuation, Councillor Swift. OK, thank you. Um, I'm just looking up the uh, planning application for the uh, clinical building to accommodate new accident emergency departments on the planning portal for Gurglees. Um And uh, there is initial target date in September, Councillor Rupal. OK. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Oh dear, sorry. Sorry to come to you at a difficult time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's OK. Um, so um, I think it's just a, just a comment that uh, I'm really pleased that, uh, that we're recommencing the ability for uh, uh, mothers to uh, bear children in, in Huddersfield. It, it's something people really want to give birth in their hometown. I think it's, uh, it, it's something that's very important to people in Huddersfield. And uh, so uh, I want to acknowledge that. And what I what I am um, unsure about really is um, is about some of the timelines here for construction um, at Huddersfield A and E, uh, and um, I, I do wonder about this because uh, there are so many capital projects going on at the moment. There's so much work going on out there. So how certain are we that these timelines are actually feasible, um, given the amount of works out there? What what um, uh, what have we put on in, in terms of the contract, in terms of penalties or such like for not delivering on time? Nicola or Anna, yourself. Um, in terms of the Hudd Huddersfield Royal Infirmary construction, we are in a position where we have appointed a uh, supplier. So we have a construction partner working with us now, which means that that gives us greater assurity regarding the feasibility of commencement dates and, and around the, that scheme feasibility in terms of the timelines. Um, I, in terms of any specific contractual elements, I, I wouldn't have that information in my head and I'm, and I'm sure that there is some commercial sensitivity around some of that, Councillor Cooper. Um, I'm not sure if any other colleagues on the call today would like to add anything to that response, but I think we can be confident by the fact that we do have a uh, an appointed supplier for the construction who's been working with us for several months um, in readiness for commencement of that construction this calendar year. OK, um, I've, I've just got two points in your, um, I realise this is for your planning applications, this engagement, but you've you got a statement that the community is broadly supportive of the proposals. Is that the community both in Calderdale and Kirklees is, is it was the term broadly that I was wondering about. Nicola. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think through the um, the brief description and the overview of the engagement that we've described today, um, you know, we've, we feel like we've delivered a, a, a robust reach in terms of that engagement. And of those just over 300 formal responses, the vast majority um, of them were supportive of the developments and the investment in, in the local um, in the local health services uh, for themselves and their families. Um, there obviously were a number of um, a number of comments made that we have been able to um, incorporate into our development proposals and that was a really helpful process. Um, there were of course a number of um, a small number of comments received that were less around the um, the 
proposed developments, the buildings themselves and what we'd shared, um, but around um, the, the clinical model. Um, so that's why we use the term broadly, um, because in the main, the vast majority of those formal responses were supportive in, in the developments and came up with some um, some um, good thoughts and ideas and suggestions in terms of the feedback that we've been able to, to incorporate into the plans. OK, thank you. Can we return now to the timeline for the business cases just before we move off this report? Um, uh, so, um, as we've said, you've got to have them all in by November. Yes, the uh, full business case for HRI and the outline business case for CRH. Both of those fit together, I would presume, that one complements the other, uh, and that is why you're, you're putting them both in together. Um, as we've said, um, we would like to see um sections of those business cases as soon as we can we need to scrutinize those business cases um and uh, follow the terms of reference and follow at uh, the points that were raised by the secretary of state and the irp and therefore we do need to scrutinize those business cases and have a little bit of time to do that so anna can you outline for us at this point in time how you can uh, let us have uh, different sections of the business cases um, as we move forward please so in, in terms of our planning processes, you'll you'll understand that we um, to get to a stage around submission of the planning applications has required us to complete our design proposals and that needed to be completed to inform our costings and our detailed modelling into the business cases. So we are right now we do not have the business cases ready. We are that is work in progress that is happening. We've already discussed that we've we have quite challenging timelines for the conclusion of that that we um, expect to submit those to our regulators by November. In terms of our internal review and governance processes, we will be undertaking that internal review in early October. So at the earliest that we would have sections of the business cases available that have gone through an internal governance process to be able to have dialogue would be during October, which I recognise is tight, but I think that is, is the timeline that we're working to. I have previously, and I would just like to state again, just for the benefit of all members of the of the committee, the, the business cases themselves are, are commercially sensitive documents in that particularly the outline business case will be used and contain information that will inform our subsequent procurement of a construction partner for a build in excess of 170 million pounds and therefore there are elements of that business case that it would for those purposes of commercial sensitivity we would need to redact which is why we talk about sections of the business cases so i think we'll, we're talking about early october as the soonest opportunity for that. And I'm very happy outside of the meeting, Councillor Smage, with yourself and Councillor Hutchinson and scrutiny yeah. officers to have conversation around Thanks. timings related. Yes, yes, that's fine. OK, so um, uh, members of the committee, um, we will be busy in October um, if those timelines are the same going down the line we will be busy in October looking at those business cases um, and uh, we obviously realise that scrutiny have to um, look at the financial implications as well of proposals um, and we will need to discuss how the scrutiny committee can do that um, in order for you to uh, follow your commercial sensitivity uh, requirements as well okay all right um, if there are no further questions on this item, uh, we will move then swiftly on uh, to item seven, uh, which is the update on community capacity in Calderdale and Kirklees. And um, this is part of what the IRP and the Secretary of State uh, said, that there had to be further work on the out-of-hospital care and hospital capacity. The two obviously sit together. Um, so who is leading uh, from this? Carol, is it yourself that's leading? Uh, so if you could introduce yourselves as you speak then, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Carol McKenna. I'm Chief Officer for Kirtley CCG. I'm going to say a few words at the start to introduce the report, but we do have colleagues um, from Calderdale CCG on the call as well, um, and we can pick up any further questions um, amongst us. So just for, um, for colleagues who have recently joined the committee, a little bit of background first. I think it is just worth, worth reminding us all that both the Calderdale CCG and in Kirklees, you know, and its predecessor, Greater Huddersfield CCG, have had for many years a strategy to develop, invest and support the integration of community services. That has that has always been our, our intent. And over the years, um, much of that has been scrutinised through the place-based scrutiny committees in each patch. Um, just a little bit of a reminder on the background, it was touched on earlier. Um, in December 2018, we, we did have the findings of an independent review. It was, it was conducted by McKinsey, as was said earlier, um, into um, some elements of our community services. And that review focused particularly on identifying best practice interventions. And that's based on you know, what, was, what was happening in other places, what was happening nationally. And the expectation is that those best practice interventions could potentially re reduce the demand for hospital services. It is worth just reminding us all again, though, at this stage, that the, the changes to the hospital retain the number, the bed capacity across the two hospitals. So we are not in a situation where we're saying that we are reducing beds in the expectation that community services will be developed as an alternative. The hospital bed base is remaining the same. So the purpose of this report is to provide an update um, following that independent review a couple of years ago, but also in the light of recent conversations, <coughs> excuse me, with yourselves. In particular, we've got three areas that we've focused on. So there is a de an update on the detail around those best practice interventions and the extent to which we have implemented them in Calderdale and Kirklees. There's some information there on the investment in community services across both places since the review and the observed impact, as we can tell, as we can assess it since 2018 on demand for hospital services. And I think it's those areas that we understand to be of particular interest to yourselves because, because you wanted to understand the, the, the relationship between community services, strategy, investment and development and what was happening in the hospital. Um, the report provides a summary of that work and we do understand it's the intention in place-based committees to look in more more detail around community services. I think in Kirklees there is a session currently being built into the work programme for later in the year, so we can go through through that in more detail in our places. So, as I said, this um, the the review that was done around the, in two thousand and eighteen did focus on these interventions and focused on three main approaches, which are summarised in the paper under section three. Many developments based on those interventions have been implemented or indeed were already in place when the review was done um, a couple of years ago. And a mapping of those service developments is provided to you all in the, the report in Appendix 1, as well as some specific individual examples um, in that, that section of the report, which I won't go through, but I'm sure we can touch on um, in the discussion. I think the important, um, well, one of the important things I want to draw your attention to is the investment in community services. So it's all very well having a strategy for something, but if the investment doesn't follow that strategy, then I think you know, we can justifiably say, is that is that real? I think in this case, the answer to that is undoubtedly yes. Um, there's been significant additional investment in community services, um, totaling 62 million over the last three years across Calderdale and well, what was Greater Huddersfield. Um, and there is also further planned investment for um, the year 2021 to 22 and beyond, um, and the, the details are contained in the report. So much of that significant investment has enabled an expansion in the workforce, in primary mental health community workforce, um, to help meet the needs of our population and enable, that, enable services to work together in a different way sometimes. Um, and that, that has been borne out during the, during the pandemic. But we will continue to build on the learning that we've seen over the last 16 months um, during the time of COVID um, to help us um, plan our services in future. So the important question then about what has this done for hospital demand? Um, we have always said that we do not just do one thing at a time when it comes to investing in community services. If we did just one thing at a time, it might be quite easy to say what impact did that one service development have 
but we always tend to make progress on a number of fronts. So we might be investing in our community nursing services and our urgent community response services in the same time that we're investing in primary care and bringing in additional roles in general practice. To be able to actually look at all of those things in the round and say it was that one that caused X reduction in hospital admissions is probably impossible. So there is something here about looking at things in the round and recognising and taking into account the level of investment that has happened and where we where we currently stand in terms of hospital demand. So, as you know, because of the, the COVID pandemic, it's 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 probably impossible to look at information and um, activity information over the last 16 months and, and compare that with any degree of robustness to what happened before because we've been in unprecedented times. So the comparative data that we've got really only exists up to 1920. So therefore, it only partially reflects the, the developments that were already underway at the time of the 2018 review and indeed probably won't reflect some of the other investments and developments that have happened since. Um, so it is very difficult to demonstrate robustly that causal link, but I do think that we do have some some positive indicators um, that we have shared in the report to um, to demonstrate that what we are doing is is taking us in the right direction. It is doing the right things. Um, so between 17, 2017, 18, and 2019, 20. We have mitigated the impact on demographic growth. When you look at non-elective admissions, they have remained broadly constant. We've reduced unplanned admissions for people aged over 90, so that the particularly older population, most likely to be highly vulnerable with um, you know, very specialist health needs. We have seen a reduction in unplanned admissions for, for people in that age group since 2017-18. And likewise, we have seen a reduced length of stay as well. Um, and that's particularly marked in older age groups, which does suggest that we are doing the right thing when it comes to being able to get people out of hospital as soon as they are medically fit and deliver care appropriately in their own homes or in care settings, if that's the right thing to do. So that reduction is, is set out in the report for those in the age groups 70 to 89 and um, 90 and over. So as, as I've said, just to, just to summarise then, we believe based on the information that we have and recognising the limitations that exist around demonstrating a direct cause and effect, that we are making good progress in relation to our community services development and the investment that each CCG has made does enable us to demonstrate an increase in capacity um, and you know staff and resources out there um, in our community settings. And like I said, um, we're very happy to discuss in, in more detail along with some of our provider colleagues how that development is taking shape and being implemented in each of our individual places. So I think that's that's my introduction. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Carol. Right then, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. I mean, we've been asking for a report on this for years, and I'm afraid I'm, what we've been provided with it doesn't really fill me with a great degree of confidence that the clinical commissioning groups know where we are and in what direction we're travelling. I don't understand why we're able to produce accounts that specify how much has been spent on this service or that service, and yet we're unable to tell what benefit has occurred from that spending, why financial accounts are treated with such reverence, and yet the human benefit from that spending remains obscure. Um, the capacity modelling that was done to, dis well, the McKinsey report from 2018 is very clear that without doing, that demographic changes would require an increased number of 43 more hospital beds across the trust if nothing were done. So, you know, saying that we're not planning to cut hospital beds now doesn't mean that there is still a need to actually absorb that additional capacity into the community. Um, the metric that there were very clear metrics used in the capacity modeling in the strategic outline case of uh, uh, flat growth for day case elective and outpatient activity, 2% growth for A&E, and 4% growth in non-elective short-stay admissions and 1% growth in non-elective long-stay admissions. 
and something that said 2% growth in community, whatever that, whatever that actually means. But the figures that have been provided to us today aren't couched in any of those terms. There's nothing that we can say is that, you know, that we haven't got the assurance that those uh, assumptions in the bed, bed modeling actually actually hold, you know, that we're actually making progress again, how we compare against those. The McKinsey report was also very clear in terms of um, the requirement for additional community beds. So a total, a, a total of 169 community beds. Where are we against that, against that uh, target? Um, it also re recommended a very clear workforce model. Now we might not not all agree with the workforce model that that was being suggested. I mean, it may, may, makes no mention of district nurses at all anywhere in that report, and uh, neither does the report that we've that we've just had. Even though they carried such a major lo workload during the height of the pandemic, um, so. You know, we've said we've that there's been so much more investment over the last uh, last three years. But what is the baseline figure? How has that been reflected in the workforce model that we are now now working with? I would have hoped to have seen a lot more detail um, that was using using metrics that actually reflected the metrics that have been used in the capacity modeling so that we can compare make sure that we are on track shall i respond to that chair and then yeah ask? carol I, yeah yeah i think maybe i'll just make a few points really just you said that the mckinsey report said there would be additional hospital beds required if nothing were to be done um I'm not quite sure how anyone could read this report and think nothing is being done. You know, 63 million over three years suggests to me that quite a lot is actually being done. Um, so I, I do think that that does need acknowledging. Um, and that money pays for staff. That money pays for you know additional um, feet on the ground caring for our patients. In terms of the metrics, I do think we have demonstrated that the metrics, well, we've used some indicators here. These are not the only metrics we look at, but in terms of the important ones about how this is impacting on the hospital, being able to mitigate the impact of demographic growth, reducing unplanned admissions in over 90s and reducing length of stay, they are actually really important. And it's not just about numbers. It's not just about, you know, money and, and counting numbers. Reducing the length of stay actually really helps with people's recovery. So the longer people stay in hospital, the more deconditioned they will become and the longer the rehabilitation might take in a number of cases. So being able to demonstrate that we are being able to get people out of hospital at an optimum time is actually really important from a patient perspective. Um, and I think I would maybe, um, and Penny might want to add a little bit about this, but I would maybe counsel against just thinking about community services in the form of beds. Actually, increasingly, it's much more about delivering care in people's own homes, um, not having um, community based hospitals, if that makes sense, with beds in them. Um, so I'm happy for colleagues to, to come in and add about what this means for the, you know, the modelling in the, in the hospital. But I do think we have got some strong information here in terms of metrics. Um, are, there any, are there any other comments, colleagues wanting to comment before? Councillor Hutchinson? No, Councillor Hutchinson. Um, can, I, I did ask for what, you know, I agree that the investment seems to be going in, but it's not been quoted what, we don't know what percentage increase in, in investment this is. So we've not been given what the baseline figure for spending is. Um, we do we do have our percentage investment obviously in our own CCGs, but I my understanding was that what the JOSCO were interested in was more the impact on the hospital services, not actually the the percentage of the investment as our you know as a percentage of our overall spend. That's why it's not in this report. What I was saying that you've said what the increase is, but we can't assess what you know that might be a tiny increase or it might be a massive increase compared with the baseline. Uh, spending, and in terms of the, fi the 
the, those figures that are few figures that are quoted in this are extremely selective. There's nothing about what's happening in Calderdale. They both they 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 so they refer to changes in Kirk Lees. Um, you know, uh, we this is we're looking at uh, the service across. You know, we the health services, the care services are an integrated whole. So we need to we need to be um, be able to understand what is happening ac across the patch. So you know, picking out uh, you know certainly it's important to reduce unplanned admissions for people aged over ninety, but it's not very good if unplanned admissions for people aged over seventy are going through the roof. And you know we do not, we haven't been given that kind of information. So I would urge that we're given information. You know, the NHS is awash with data, but as some wags have said, it's got there's very little information. But I cannot imagine that there's a shortage of data that allows that prevents us from actually being able to express the performance of the overall system in ways that can be compared year upon year. Carol? Um, I, I take the point. I, I, I'm not sure what I, um, I, can, I can answer any further on that really than what I already have, but um, I don't know, Debbie, whether you want to pick up on any of the questions about Calderdale data specifically. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Carl Hutchinson. So, yeah, the, I mean, the, the information is illustrative in the, in the overview report, but uh, clearly what sits behind these two very detailed pieces of analysis um, Calderdale's figures are very similar to those in Kirklees, um, and particularly um, the one, the uh, mitigation of the demographic growth, which in Calderdale was about 1.3%. Um, and also in terms of uh, bed days, um, reduced its um, uh, bed days, uh, the reduction in bed days is um, significant as well for in the over 70s. Um, it was one um, a reduction of one bed day per per admission per day, and the admissions for at CRH are about 70, 75 a day. We can pull some more information together, I think, to make this more uh, live. That's what the plan was to do when this information goes to our, our OSC in, in Calderdale um, and to share a much broader set of information, as, as uh, Carol uh, mentioned. Uh, that we have quite a lot more data, but as Carol said, we were trying to present this at a system level rather than a individual level. I think Councillor Hutchinson's point is at a system level, yes, but a system level across both. Was that your point, Councillor yeah, Hutchinson? Yes, yeah, so I come in there. That this yeah, is not yeah. at a system level. This is at an individual level. It's not. You haven't produced the data. And and sorry, but um, I, I used to be a risk underwriter. And and when you get a report, you don't look at what's in the report. You look at what's excluded from the report. And, and the inference from reading this report is there's information behind this report which we we don't see, we haven't got, and therefore we don't know about it. And, and I think Council Hutchins is completely correct. Why, why have you picked over 90? What, why, why is it not the report give us the data for the whole set, not just individual sets, which, which from a, um, a, a, as I said, a risk underwriter point of view, I would say, oh, you're, you're hiding something behind the other data. I don't know whether you are, and I'm not accusing you of hiding something other than beyond the data, but that's the inference from re that is a potential inference from reading the report. Can I just ask you a question as well? You mentioned the mitigation of impact of demographic growth between 2017 and 2020 on non-elective admissions. Uh, when was the end date? Did you use the whole of 2020 or did you stop at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, the beginning of the pandemic um, was March 2020, wasn't it really? That was when it started to take effect. So our... Yeah. So, so when, when, when was the end date of that data set? Well, our planning years run from the first of April to the end of March. So, right. if if it was if it was the end of March, it would have been broadly around the time of the start of the pandemic. So that 2020 was 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 that. That's fine. That's a that's a question I'm going to ask because it, because if you're reading this report without knowledge of end dates of of hospital trust dates, you would read 2020 as the whole of 2020. All right, not no, at the sorry. end of March. Yeah, but I think yeah. I think when you're producing data and when you're producing data sets, it's important to have that as uh, that that data and available. 
But I have to say, I think it, I think I would like to see as a, as a question and a recommendation, I would like to see the full data sets that have done this rather than just three selective items and particularly three selective items in 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 half of the in, in half of the representation. So in other words, I would like to see it split total. I would like to see it split and then per Kirklees and per Calderdale and the total data, not just over 90 each age group. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swift. Thank you. Um, I think Mike, between Mike and Colin, they've covered quite a lot. Very disappointed about Calder Girl not being involved in this. And I don't really understand how somebody can sit here and say, well, we've got lots of data. Why the dickens haven't we been given it if you've got lots of data? But you know, um, Colin said about community services, community capacity. I must have been around a long time because at most health tech meetings I went to run about community capacity. It might have had loads of money spent on it. I don't know what that money has been spent on, but we are still struggling. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we had 71 people in hospital because we couldn't find anywhere to put, you know, to send them to a care home or go back up. That doesn't fill me with joy that um, the community capacity is enough. Um, and just one last point, I think. Um, no, I'll leave that one. Thank you. Thank you. Carol and Debbie, do you want to come back on that, please? I think we've picked up the points on data, haven't we? So we can pick up outside with, with Richard and Mike about what um, what else needs to be provided. If there's anything specifically on, on community and Calderdale, I think maybe that needs to be from either Debbie or Penny. Um, I, I think the reference to the uh, transfer of care list, I think, is what um, Councillor Swift has identified. Uh, the transfer of care list is um, the 70 exists across the two um place that it's the entire the retirement of the number of people on an outward journey from hospital. Um, there is no doubt um, that part of the issue there is the acuity. So what I think has happened in the pandemic is we've had late presentations and we've had um, people that have um, been in a position where they've not sought help for conditions. Um, that is emerging as a result, not only are the numbers um, attending hospital um, increasing for minor conditions, but some of the acuity, uh, the acuity of some of the uh, patients that are ultimately admitted, that does impact ultimately on our ability to discharge. Um, the factors of the market as well. We know our care homes are struggling at the moment um, and, um, at, you know, in terms of staff resilience, etc. There's a, there's a significant amount of factors that would come into play in terms of our ability to discharge. Um, our discharge rate remains actually um, significantly um, but it positive, it, it's remained static, it, but the volume of patients being discharged is increased. Um, that we've lots of information on discharge particularly and would be happy to share that with uh, Councillor Swift. Uh, thank you. I think uh, if we can uh, go through the scrutiny officers for information so the whole committee can have the information, that would be useful. Uh, Penny, you wanted to come in at this point, did you? Yeah. Um Hi, um, Penny Woodhead. I'm the Chief Quality Nursing Officer in both of the CCGs. It was just to pick up on the broader issue of um, Councillor Swift had made in relation to where's the investment? Is that increasing um, um, services and staff in community? I'd just like to just draw your attention back to the two um, appendices in the report that list the range of services that have been invested in um, and how they link back to the McKinsey's um, 12 interventions. So there are a number of things there where CCGs have invested and that means either investment in staff or technology to enable um, better services in the community. Now, obviously, we've got there's much more detail in our local reports around each of those services that we can talk about in our local um, Local scrutiny, but those do give you a flavour of the range of services that are now available for our populations. Okay, thank you. Councillor Upal. 
sorry, it took me a while to find a mute button there. I think most of my um, the points I was going to raise have, have been covered. Um, I, I was going to talk about primary care and, uh, and the data sets. I mean, just on the data sets, I do understand why length of stay and uh, reduced uh, unplanned admissions for people aged overnight. I do understand why that's important because I am certain that probably overnight, it, you know, there's going to be additional care needs and stuff that might take longer. Length of stay is obviously very important in terms of the well-being for the patient as well um, and trying to reduce that. I think that's important. But I do agree with what other councils have said um, about making sure that we are able to see the other data sets because right now we just can't tell uh, tell what, what's happening there. And the only other point was around obviously primary care. There's obviously quite a bit of um, investment that you've talked about here, totaling 62 million over three years. Um, but in particular, I know in the deputation they mentioned GP uh, services and they have, you know, it does feel they have been struggling over the past year. Uh, primary care has been struggling, particularly with COVID. And I think anyone trying to access services have found how difficult it is, particularly if, if you don't have that digital access um, um, with a GP and actually being able to go and see one in person is obviously very difficult as well. So I'm just wondering how much of that um, has been assessed in terms of the impact, particularly in the, in the last year and how that might make you think about um, the community care services slightly differently. Um, it's, just, it's just trying to get a, a feel for that really. Can I respond Car to that? Carol, yeah. yeah. Carol. And then I, I did want to come back to another point as well for me uh, just after. So um, you're absolutely right that GP practices at the moment are under huge demand. There's no, there's no getting away from that. And just as we've talked previously about backlogs for, you know, planned operations in hospital, it does feel like there is a backlog of demand for general practice services. And, and I think what's happened during the pandemic is for a variety of reasons, um, people have held back, possibly. They haven't wanted to bother the GP when, when they know that circumstances are really difficult. And other more routine monitoring um, and review type services have not been able to be conducted during the pandemic um, because of the, the varying you know, restrictions that have been in place. So what we are undoubtedly seeing at the moment is some of that demand now, now coming through. Um, our GPs are our GP practices are doing a fantastic job and the information that we have available, which is a bit limited in relation to general practice, but does indicate that they are, you know, the last prop decent comparison is probably March to March because then things really did change. But they were seeing significant, significantly more um, appointments, seeing more patients than they were at the same time in the previous year. But we are working really closely with our, our practices and our primary care networks to understand you know, how long it's going to take to work through some of this pent up demand, if you like, and how much of it might might remain. Um, I think that's it's related to, but the, the question about investment in general practice almost exists alongside it. So nationally, there has been um, an increase in the level of investment that's gone into general practice. The uplift this year was in the order of 3.5%, which is higher than many other sectors. There is also additional investment on top in things like the additional roles that we've talked about. There's, there's been COVID um, significant invent, investment to support the, the delivery of services through COVID, investment in the vaccination programme. So the, uh, don't have all that detail to hand, but there is a lot of investment in general practice. But that's in some ways at the moment um, almost being overtaken by you know the levels of, of demand and pressure that's existing in general practice and, and we are working really closely with our colleagues in both Calderdale and Kirklees to understand that a bit more. I wonder if it's if that's if it's okay Chair if I could just go back to the question about the other data in relation to the other age groups you know on the back yeah. of the old 90s yeah. point um, yeah. I'm literally just as we've been talking I was just looking something up and um this only relates to Kirklees and obviously we'll provide um, more detail outside as we've agreed. But the, the position, as I understand it, in Kirklees is that for the period that we're looking at, so between 2017 and 2020, the non-elective admissions were broadly constant across the population um, as a whole, except in the 90 plus age group, which did see the significant reduction. The reason we've particularly drawn that out is that the 90 plus population um, accounts for um, less than 1% of our population in total. However, they do account for 5% of non-elective admissions and more than 9% of non-elective bed days. 
So, so by being able to make those changes as they affect that age group, it, it does have more of a more of an impact on on the hospital. But we'll we'll provide that separately. I just thought I'd mention it now okay. because of yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. Can I just ask about you mentioned about uh, planning for demand, um, and I'd just like to ask about um, and the uh, acuteness of what you've seen coming through uh, because of um, people not uh, um, seeking help um, under no as they would under normal circumstances maybe. So how are you planning for the demand in community capacity that will meet the demand in hospital services uh, going forward? Um, because presumably with the increase in acute uh, cases, uh, there will be an increased demand on the hospitals and therefore an increased demand on uh, different levels of service in community capacity to what there might have been previously, which all goes to uh, the questions about can the system that you are proposing moving forward with this reconfiguration, will it cope with that demand for, I'm presuming you are planning for a length of time for that demand, um, and, and how is that community capacity? Because yes, okay, 17, 18, it was this, but now, 21 22 it may be completely different or and demand a lot higher so how are you going to adapt your services so that the hospital can do what it plans in retaining the number of beds thanks carol i see debbie's put her hand up i was actually going to suggest as well maybe penny might want to say something around things like our aging well program and some of the investments that we have made to respond to covid in community and then it might be that anna or, or nicola want to say something about hospital-based demand so maybe if i could pass over to either debbie or penny okay uh, thanks carol so one of the biggest initiatives i think that um, the um that Jask will be interested in is the urgent community response so exactly as you've painted uh, the picture, Councillor Smidge, the com urgent community response is a national um, uh, a national initiative. Uh, it's been delivered particularly at PACE in Kirklees, they're a, a national pilot site, and in Calderdale we are um, a site that's following uh, and learning and uh, well on our way to setting this up. Um, it's come down with a significant amount of national investment as well. Um, and the uh, metrics for this service are um, that it delivers a two hour health response and a two day uh, social care reablement response. Um, it's probably the biggest change that we've seen in community services for uh, perhaps a decade, if not more. Um, and it's something that has come to the fore more, particularly in Calderdale since uh, this report was written. Um, I think it's material in terms of its impact. I think in addition, there are a range of other services that have um, commenced perhaps as a result of the pandemic, the long COVID services, the pulse oximetry services. So um, from the time of writing this, I think we've seen significant um, change, but I think the urgent community response is one that um, the committee might well want to be cited on. OK, Penny, did you want to come in? Yeah, so um, yeah, so Debbie's talked about urgent community response, which was one of the ones that I was um, thinking the committee might be interested in. And, and certainly when we get into our place conversations, we can talk in more detail about how um, how those are being implemented. But a couple of other areas that I think we've referenced in the report um, in over this last um, 16, 18 months, the increased support around our our care homes. So in the announced health in care homes program link, linked practitioners from general practice, uh, linked community, nursing staff, training, support, which, you know, for our most vulnerable populations, they are receiving much 
much more proactive care to reduce the the need for um, um, hospital assessments or admissions. There's more to do that will be expanded further in this year and next year through the ageing care programme. There's a national ambition to move beyond our care homes into other social care sectors and have the 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 NHS support um, um, other um, other sectors, domiciliary care supported living and so on. Um, we'd made a commitment early last year that we wouldn't just focus on older people's um, homes in relation to enhanced health and care home and actually um, we were ahead of national policy in relation to people with a learning disability and mental health locally. So um, uh, you know that that is about more NHS clinical support into the into the care homes, and then the other one um, we we mentioned earlier on, Councillor Hutchinson mentioned the the issue around um, community beds and the whole policy shift around home first and discharge to assess. So the evidence base in relation to you know people may be medically optimised but not um, at a place where they are optimised sufficiently to determine where their long term care um, needs to be. If you remain in a hospital bed or in even in a community bed, there is the risk of deconditioning and we are there is more investment going into support a home first approach and therapy input into the community using some of the investment that Debbie has alluded to out the Aging Well programme. Um, I do believe for Kirklees we've an opportunity to come and talk to local scrutiny around our Aging, Aging Well programme that includes urgent community for response, end of life care homes, uh, discharge to assess amongst a number of other things. So again more in that sort of place detail conversation in the future I think. Okay so Anna um, do you have to in your business cases do you have to show that expected future demand can be coped with uh, and that community capacity can be coped with uh, as a result of that future demand? In, in terms of our modelling within the business cases and demand, um, the current um, position that we're at coming at, out of the pandemic, um, particularly in relation to elective care, is that we have backlogs of care of people who haven't been able to access treatment. Um, our approach to that is that we are providing additionality of resource and um, treatment options with the intention that we will clear those backlogs prior to reconfiguration in 2025 around elective care services. So whilst we spoke earlier today around completion of the um, Accidents and Emergency Department at Huddersfield um, in 2023, that will con be continuing the current model of A&E delivery that we currently have in a new building. It is not until 2025 that we will be enacting the full change in the clinical model of service enabled by the development at Calderdale Royal Hospital. And our modelling assumption is that we will provide in those intervening years that additionality required to clear those backlogs ahead of that reconfiguration. And that's um, specific around the elective work. But then I think the examples that have been given by Debbie and Penny is about how it's also addressing the current acuity we're seeing for people who have had delayed access to their to their care and they've seen exacerbation of condition and increased acuity. So can I be clear for the A and E uh, work at HRI, do you have to demonstrate that community capacity is in place to take pressures off those A and E services that will be reconfigured before 2025? In terms of our business case modelling, we will, as we did do in the strategic outline case, we will look at historic trends and patterns of access and demand. We did that over a three year period with support from regulators and Department of Health analysts. We will refresh that in light of the reasonable assumptions that we should make around the rate of demographic growth over the next five year period and beyond to make sure that the size of our hospitals is sized appropriately. Um, our expectation is that some of these increased demands we're seeing currently at this moment coming out of the pandemic will be transitional additional capacity needed as opposed to long term planning. Um, you know, in the interests for 
members of the public, our, our commitment is to clear the backlogs of care as quickly as we can. We recognise um, the, the importance of that um, and doing that um, to clear that, which should then we, we would then be testing whether there are any other changes in our demographic modelling assumptions, which at this point in time, we're not we don't anticipate there are. OK, thanks. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I take on board the idea that if you have an elderly, frail person and they're just lying in bed doing nothing, whether in hospital or in intermediate care bed or even in their own home, they are going to be deconditioned. It's, you know, if there isn't the space around within the wards and around the beds, if there aren't the people, the staff to be able to actually uh, help them exercise and re-able in the ward, yes, they will decondition. But it is, have you not thought that the fact that there's 70 people de with delayed discharge, as, Gre as Debbie has said, um, due to their increasing acuity, uh, that the lack of community beds may be part of the explanation for why there are those delayed discharges. Um, and so insisting that it can all be done at home, well, it doesn't seem to be being done at home now if there's that number of people who are languishing within the hospital. Um, I'm also very concerned that in the five-year plan, the long-term plan for the NHS, the community response teams had a very prominent role for district nurses. And there is no mention of district nurses within the uh, within uh, the the report on workforce that that's been sent i've heard very we previously this committee has heard very negative uh, attitudes towards district nurse, nursing and any suggestion that there should be um, that 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 they were a, a particularly uh, valuable part of the workforce i would like to see some consideration that these, these staff who've been very important, particularly in the end of life uh, care during, during the height of the pandemic, that that is actually recognised and that they are indeed part of these enhanced uh, com multidisciplinary community teams. Carol, did you want to come back? Or uh, Debbie? Um, it may well be that Penny wants to speak on this one, but um, I think it's it's fair to say I totally agree about the huge importance of um, our community nurses in all our models. And whatever it may be not picked up, Colin, in a way that, that shows that they are certainly a, a critical element of our care homes work that Penny mentioned, urgent community response, end of life. And um, they're probably not picked out individually because actually we are much more moving to MDT working. Um, I take your point, they're very important, but I think just to assure you that they are part of every model that we create in the community and, and indeed probably the backbone of, of them all. I, I would agree, Debbie, and I think in those investment figures that, that are there, you know, hidden within them is investment in our community services providers who will have used that funding to increase a range of community nursing staff, not just district nurses. And I think maybe just on the point, first of all, Colin, that you made about um, the numbers on the medically fit for discharge um, list. Um, I mean, Debbie's closest to this, uh, but colleagues in the CCGs and the Trust review that on a daily basis. And the reasons for the, the any delay to that discharge are, are documented. And it is my understanding is it is it's not just about access to beds and community. There will could be a whole range of issues. And if we were picking up that one of the fundamental problems was around community-based beds, then we would do something about that because we have brought online community beds during COVID at a very short notice when that has been needed. So that, that is kept under very regular review. Okay, thanks. Penny, did you have anything? Anna, I think you were indicating, but has that been addressed now? Yeah, okay. And Penny, have your points been... Yep, yeah, that's OK. Um, right. Can I just ask two questions then to round off uh, this item, please? Um, one, um, the workforce capacity, you've mentioned about the additional uh, investment in that. And I'd like to 
uh, know whether that is sustained over a period of time because obviously if you've invested now is that sustainable over a number of years to be able to uh, uh, carry that on and these you referred to these tables at the end of the report in appendix one it may be me and it probably is you know me i have difficulty um but um i'm not quite getting these uh reports so for instance end of life care i understand that the x's are against that the end of life care the implementations to best practice are against the a to m that's earlier on in the report right but what i'm not getting is those are the ones you've implemented but are there any that you haven't implemented um that should be there so if i take the top line uh, end of life care i can see that it's across the board the x is where you've implemented but um for instance there's nothing in h which is rapid response and i would have thought there would have needed to be some rapid response uh in there uh, to avoid uh any uh necessity for hospital uh intervention etc so i'll perhaps not put that quite um, right but do you know what I mean I'm not sort of getting that information and I'm just wondering if it's me that's misunderstanding these tables whether I need another cup of tea thank you um, I don't think you're misunderstanding them my understanding is that there's an x in the box where that service is currently in place um, I'm afraid I can't give you detail about specific lines and specific boxes. I'd need to go back to the relevant service manager to ask to understand why there might be gaps in those. So if there are specific bits you'd like us to follow up, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, so what I'm not getting is, is there any that should be X's that aren't implemented? I don't know off the top of my head, I'm afraid. <laughs> and that's quite a detailed question. Yeah, I, I think... Um, um, and, you know we have talked about uh, the information you have and the, and the information that you don't have in front of you today and um, the more detailed work that we've done kind of brings to life each of the lines really so for the end of life line what there would be the calderdale report as in the kirkley's report would be a full understanding of um and a bit more of a picture of each of those services um, and I'm sure when we get to the point where we're looking at these in detail at place we can bring that to life because I understand why that is difficult to um, engage with a series of processing boxes. And um, I think when we do that properly, uh, fully um, at, at a place level, I think that's a bit of learning for how we present that. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to pick up the uh, the bit about workforce. No, no. Um, well, I don't know if, uh, if I could just, before you go on the workforce. So I think what would have been helpful in this for a strategic look at whether this is implemented fully and whether there's the capacity in the systems would have been for something like this to have indicated as well where into where things were still to be implemented. So for instance, if we take the top line, A to E are implemented, G, J, K and, X, and L are implemented, then is there anything in those other boxes that are to be implemented? Do you know what I mean? And I think that would have been helpful to gauge how far along this line you are so that we know, is this, does this mean that you are full, uh, you know, the capacity is fully there or is there still some work to do? Um, and I understand that the detail will be discussed in places, but it, to me, it's not a full picture for the strategic look. And, and you know me, Carol and Penny, I, I do do detail a little bit. Yeah, Penny. Yeah, so um, I think probably you've articulated um, uh, an alternative view around it. So I was looking at it thinking um, there may be there may be gaps that are legitimate gaps because actually there isn't a piece of work that's necessary for that intervention for that particular scheme. Let us say that to you so you're not guessing and also indicate where we've got a piece of transformation work that's currently underway or is planned for a future year. So, um, yeah, that's really helped that's helpful i'm sure we can we can work on that that's I think, brilliant 
and yeah. then can you move on to the workforce? The yeah. One, yeah. So my um, uh, very simple answer to the workforce is the the money that we've been talking about is recurrent investment in the workforce. There is the challenge around workforce supply, isn't there? And we've each got our place-based workforce groups working in partnership with all of our providers and working with Health Education England at um, current um, current workforce, future roles, um, future demands. So, um, yeah, we've a Calderdale workforce group with all partners, we've got Kirkland's workforce groups, and they are working on some things together where it makes sense to do that. And um, I think, you know, for me, it is better connected at place now is the workforce conversation than it has been for, for many, many years and features very heavily in the planning submissions that we've had to put forward to NHS England this year. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a huge amount in terms of that work, that workforce development. So I think the short answer is recurrent investment. There's more to do in terms of workforce um, capacity, new roles development to sustain um, to sustain in the future because workforce never stands, stands still. We, we do different things over periods of time and that's the right thing to do. Yeah, Debbie, sorry I cut you off. Did you have anything to add? No, OK, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, OK. So uh, if we can move swiftly on then to item eight, because I think we've already started on this a little bit um, and this is learning from the pandemic. So is there somebody who's going to introduce this to begin with? Um, and... I'm conscious as well that Mark Davis is is here in the meeting and we haven't heard from him. Um, it would be perhaps useful to hear from him about um, the the uh, emergence A and E side of things as well in response to this section. Thank you. Who's going to start? That's me, as if by magic you've already introduced me. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> so don't make me. I'm Mark Davis. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine. Um, I'm one of the clinical leads for reconfiguration at CHFT. Um, and I'm going to introduce the, the paper that's been provided of how we've learned from the pandemic. Um, and it's, it's split really into three topics. So the new ways that we're working now and plan to work in the future, how we're going to deal with the backlog um, and how the, the pandemic is, has informed the design of the new buildings that we're designing. Um, there's nothing like um, necessity um, to, to provide change um, and there was nothing like the pandemic to drive that change. Um, so we changed the way we worked pretty much at the end of March. Um, a lot of it was done quite suddenly and unexpectedly, um, but generally a lot of those changes have remained. Um, and we were keen at the end, sort of, when we were well into the pandemic and the, the, the initial lockdown back in June, we underwent an engagement exercise with colleagues, um, with patients and the public um, and partner organisations of how we had changed the way we worked and how how they had gone, what was good about them and what would we like to improve on those changes that we'd made. Um, and that came up with basically 12 themes um, which are listed in, in the paper. But key things, for example, you know, Remote appointments. We'd been trying for a few years to to introduce the idea of sort of virtual appointments with patients to avoid, avoid them coming to the, the hospital building. Um, that took off at a pace. Um, the way we worked with partners, organisations, we realised as as a system that we could, all couldn't do everything. Um, so it was much improved cross boundary working, um, integrating models of care in in a new way that we hadn't really. Um, giving it the energy that it needed previously. Um, our workforce um, worked tremendously well across the whole of the NHS and all the other um, essential services, but we realised that looking after our workforce was very, very important, and that took on a, a new, new energy. Um, there's all sorts of different things like um, direct assessment pathways. So rather than somebody sitting in A&E with a problem that, with their eye, for me to say three hours later, you need to see an eye specialist, we're getting them straight to the eye specialist. So let's let's miss, miss out the middleman for those people who clearly need the input of, a, of an expert. So we've in, increased the number of patients who are, are being streamed directly from the ED and increasingly from the community. Um, 
So we've now got a system whereby if the ambulance has got a patient who they think is just got a, a relatively minor issue, but they're frail, then they can talk directly to our frailty team who can provide ad advice and then they can link with the rapid community response team so that patient doesn't necessarily need to come into hospital at all. So these are all things that we've we've put in place and we are working on to strengthen the way we move forward. Um, they're all things generally that we were thinking of doing over a period of years as we got into this transformation and reconfiguration program but they've been been driven forward again because of that need that was needed as part of the the pandemic response um in terms of the recovery plan um we know that during the pandemic a lot of non non-urgent care had to be postponed because of the the demand that was placed on urgent care um and at chft we, we dealt with over 2000 patients with covid who've been discharged into the community, but that wasn't without um, any impact on our delivery of other services. So we have a backlog um, along with other trusts across the country. Um, and back in May, um, we published our uh, recovery plan at the public meeting of the trust board, um, which had been shared with our regulators and partners. Um, and we are working through that plan now to reduce the waiting lists um, for elective care safely and quickly. Um, while appreciating at the moment there's still a significant demand for non-elective services across our trust. So again we've got colleagues who are working over and above to deliver um, that backlog of care, so weekend lists, wait lists in theatre, extra lists in the evening, um, extra clinics, a lot of, lot of extra work going on to, to meet that, that extra demand that's been put on us by the backlog. Um, we're also using health inequalities to complement the clinical prioritisation. We know that a lot of patients um, have suffered disproportionately as a result of the delay. Um, so rather than just using clinical prioritisation, we're using health inequalities. So we've had a huge effort on meeting the backlog of patients with learning disabilities because we know that they are impacted greater by the the, the illnesses or the symptoms that require treatment. We're still using technology and at the same time we're still maintaining our one culture of care, looking after those staff who I may be keen to work over and above and extra and every weekend to meet the backlog. We have to look after our staff as well um, because they are the cornerstone of the delivery of care. Um, we're also working with partners across the local system and West Yorkshire into how we can work together to improve the, the, the management of the backlog. So we're working with, with particularly mid Yorks around oncology um, and some other partners so that we're not all working in isolation. This becomes a system-wide solution to a system-wide problem. Um, and with all the plans we've got in place, we are committed and are confident that we will have managed the backlog prior to reconfiguration in 2025. So our plans for the, the, the capacity beyond 2025 are on the basis that we've dealt with the backlog. Um, okay. the, the final bit in the paper is around how we've used the pandemic to, to, to support our designs. And I think the key message here is that the operating model that we're describing actually meets that, that predominantly in that we will have an elective site and a non-elective site, and that in itself is key to how we will deal with any future pandemics. Um, and it's also part of the, the NHS long-term plan um, to separate elective and non-elective care. But specifically in terms of the design, um, things like storage, space configuration of storage to provide having to move between areas, um, changes to the way we ventilate the new build um, because that's key as well and having separate ventilation systems for different areas, a um, lot more single occupancy rooms, improved capacity to segregate the ED um, at Huddersfield and subsequently at Calderdale, um, dedicated isolation rooms in the emergency department at, at Huddersfield um, and making sure at the same time that the whole building 
is being built to improve flexibility and resilience for uh, when or if another such pandemic comes along. Um, so I'll stop there. But happy to take any questions. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll open it up for questions, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I really welcome what you've said about flexibility as being vital. I mean, during the pandemic, we saw all sorts of uh, spaces needing to be used for intensive care and uh, or high dependency work, whether that was operating theatres or others. Um, so how has that flexib the flexibility for intensive care provision been reflected in the design of the, of the new hospital? Um, and does the proposal to have uh, an elective care site, you know, during an emergency like the pandemic or like a bad winter, you know, we're regularly wrong footed by winter, even though it tends to come around most years. How will you have the flexibility to be able to expand the capacity for people who need urgent care? If you're going to say, well, they can't use one particular hospital, you know, they can't use part of the hospital estate um, because we're continuing to plough on with with the hip replacements and the, and, and the knee replacements, regardless of uh, of the overcrowding in the hot side. Yeah, so if I take intensive care flexibility um, and resilience, um, we haven't got into the detailed design of. Calderdale, um, but we are planning to increase the capacity within intensive care at Calderdale. And we have recognised that at the current time, the, any increase in capacity in critical care at Calderdale is into an adjacent area which has got the capability to, but isn't normally used. So we've identified we will have to identify a second area which could be utilised for increased intensive care capacity if required. So we recognise that by increasing the intensive care unit where we want to, we've then removed the resilient resilience element, so we have to recreate that. So that's part of the, 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 the design plan effectively. Um, in terms of the bed capacity, the bed modelling is based on non-elective beds effectively at, at Huddersfield, at Calderdale. Um, so that has taken into account raises and falls that will happen through the year. Um, but we're confident, based on the modelling that we've done, um, that that will meet capacity. And of course, we've still got uh, plans for additional beds at Huddersfield as part of the plan, as part of maintaining that current bed base. Can I, that, that's fine. Can I just ask a specific one? You mentioned community phlebotomy. Yes. Uh, I mean, it, that used to exist and it, it then largely vanished and people were having to have ambulances arranged to bring them up to the hospital to have blood taken for prothrombin times and things like that, which seemed a complete nonsense. What, what is that, what's the state of community phlebotomy? Yeah, and I think what, we, what we've realised again, and it's part of the pandemic, but also part of the, the inequalities work that we're doing, you know, like you say, we made a decision a few years, years ago that it was a good idea and provide a much more efficient service if we centralised all phlebotomy services into the hospital. And for the vast majority, and if you look at the public as a whole, that's a good idea. But there, we're recognising now that there is a group of patients for whom that's not a good idea and that actually puts them at disadvantage. And that's where, where we're sort of changing the way we do things. So on the whole phlebotomy maybe in the in the hospital, but there will be a group of, of patients where where community service would be better served for them. OK, thank, thank you. you. Councillor Barnes. Uh, thank you for that report, Mark. Um, I've got um, uh, a couple of a couple of questions and, and maybe a point for, for for later reference. I think the first thing I just wanted to ask is, and, and if I've misunderstood this, I, I apologise, but the way you described 
that sort of, um, I hesitate to call it fast tracking of patients to see the specialist. I don't mean it in that way, but those that's the language I'll use. Is that putting a lot more pressure requirement training on the first person, what you would term the first the first contact that the the, the patient has? And how is the you know how, how is the trust managing that process? Because it is it, it could potentially put a lot of pressure on that first individual. Uh, yes, it does mean that the person at the front has to have probably an extended set of skills. Um, so we're meeting that on two counts, really. One is you know, that we make sure that the most senior members of staff are at the front door. So where possible, somebody like me would sit at the front door. So I'd become more of a directing people to the right place. So like or a bouncer. Other senior colleagues. <laughs> the challenge we've got, of course, is that we're at the moment we're having to do that on two sites because we've got two fully functioning emergency departments. When we centralise our, our critical care services on one site and we've got one bigger accident emergency department, that, that capacity will be much increased so we can do that much better. Okay, okay. thank you for that. A, a couple of things, um, really, one of which is you, you mentioned in the report, and this is probably something for um, uh, later or, or a later date, not for now, but when, when you mentioned in the report that the intention is to catch up uh, by 2020, by the, the electives, uh, sorry, the non-electives by 2025, it will be nice at some future point to have a report on that in terms of how, you know, in terms of the framework, how it's going, um, uh, for sight of that. But in particular, the one issue that I do have in the report is you make reference to um, digital plans and in particular supporting patients who may lack skills and confidence or have limited or no access to equipment and connectivity. How are you identifying that and actually how are you going to support those patients? Yeah, and it's, it's about how we recognise which patients, you know, a telephone consultation is not good enough or they don't have a computer. So yeah, so we, we 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 generally we're making contact with patients by telephone, um, and then we can make an assessment of how how they can access any future appointments through that, whether that be with the help of a relative or they need a face to face. So it's by making direct contact with the patient or their relative is how we're addressing it, and then the answer and how we deal with it is to deal with each patient individually and where, where a, a virtual consultation is not appropriate or doesn't meet their needs, then we have to go back to as we did it before. So, so you're not really supporting patients who may lack skills and you're not really supporting them because if they don't have the skills, you can't support them, can you? Well, yeah, we can have colleagues, colleagues to work with them to help them use the technology. And so if someone's got no broadband, no smartphone, you can't support them, can you? No, but we can if if there's if there's patients who need long term interventions or regular contact, then we can support them with any applications they may need for broadband. If I may, with permission, Councillor Barnes, I might just be able to add a little bit to to the response around how we're supporting people who may be digitally excluded. We have been working with both councils and doing some work in Calderdale and Kirtley's, um, <clears throat> working with. Um, the local colleges around providing training on adult adult education programs around use of technology but we recognize it's not just about skills development it is also about people who don't have uh, wi-fi access the data poor or they lack the skills and competencies so it's providing training but it's also um, working with both councils around potential digital hub sites in calderdale and kirtley's where members of the public would be able to access technology and be supported to use okay, it. Okay, can, can I just come in here? Because this is saying to me, from an outside point of view, that the primary appointment is going to be not face to face, but digital. That's what you're saying to me here is throughout this process, throughout the answers you've given me here and, and that on the page is that the primary default setting for patient for, for patients accessing is going to be digital and not face to face. Can you assure me that that is not the case? Um, I, I'll, I'll come back on that and Mark might want to come in as well. But in terms of the determination about 
um, how a patient is offered access to the services is very personalised um, around the needs of that individual patient. So we do offer face to face appointments, taking into account a number of factors regarding um, that individual patient's needs, um, their particular skills. So it, it's not a purely a, a default to a digital solution. It's recognising individual um, vulnerability, support needs around that. We, we do have feedback that for a vast majority of people, digital access is providing them with advantage in terms of convenience and access and also the ability for them to involve other members of their family um, and in, in support in that dialogue. Um, but it, it remains that we, we offer a personalised response which reflects the individual needs of patients. OK, so can I put a scenario for you that someone like me who is technically adept can understand it, but I want a face to face appointment. Will I get one if I ask for one? Yes. OK, otherwise, otherwise we're failing you. Mark, that's the answer I wanted throughout this whole thing. That's the answer I wanted. That, that, that's, yeah. that's that's what residents want. That's what the people who, who you know, we, we represent want. They want to be able to have, if they want a face-to-face -face appointment, they want to be able to have a face-to-face -face appointment. Yeah. If, if, and, and it's not down to, sorry, it's not down to whether they're digitally skillful. It's not down to them. They're, 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 it's, down to the, it's down to them, not somebody else's interpretation of them. Does that make sense? And Mark, you've answered the question. So thank you very much for that. Yes, and I think it's, I think we've got to take things in balance here, haven't we? That working from home is great most of the but, time. But, some of the yes. time it's not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Digital consultations are great, but some of the time they're not. But at the same time, there's a balance between what we can and what we can't deliver. So I think everybody who wants a face-to-face -face appointment should should get one. Whether everybody who wants a face-to-face -face appointment will get one every time they need an appointment, that's a different question. Yeah. Because just the same as everybody who wants an X-ray will get one yes, most no. of the time, but they're not going to get, you know, we've, yeah. we've, it, we can't do everything that everybody wants all of the time, but we need to make things possible for everybody all of the time. Thank yeah. you, Mark. So, so can we just ask as well then, uh, for the people who are finding it more convenient to have uh, to digital uh, the digital hubs that you said um have you asked people who can't access digital if they would if they feel they would like uh, more digital uh, i'm thinking particularly for people who maybe can't access digital for various reasons not just because of the broadband but maybe because they just can't hear do you know what i mean and uh, and things like this but going to a digital hub and accessing for an appointment, have you actually, is there a, a lot of support for that? Because personally, I would want somewhere private to discuss my health. Uh, and that for me, fills me with a concern. Yeah. Anna? So in, in terms of a response to that, of you know, in a, in a digital hub that could provide facility for um, private rooms, separate rooms, in, so to protect privacy and dignity. In terms of our engagement with um, uh, patients and, and members of the public, we have over a number of years um, undertaken engagement with specific groups within our communities and we work with Healthwatch to do that specifically to reach out in, into certain groups to ask how would you like to access care, what, what are some of the barriers and that include having dialogue with people who are, had um, sight or hard of hearing impairment, people with learning disability, people with autism and we have um, taken the findings from that to inform our design around some of the options available for access. I think the pandemic, as it has for every service, has brought into sharp relief um, the recognition that there is more that we need to do to make sure that we are protecting people from digital exclusion. And I think that work, which is really accelerated since the pandemic, working with our local council partners is about providing other options in community settings where that support, that training could be provided. I think as Mark's just said, that would be 
a, an option, not a mandated, you must go to a hub, but it's to provide an, an extra option. And also, it, did you, we talk about digital exclusion, but also the people who uh, might be, we don't want people excluded who want to actually see people face to face. You know, the exclusion goes the other way as well. Um, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you. I mean, uh, I've, I've said this before, but there are uh, specialties where clinical examination is almost de rigueur for every, almost every attendance. I'm thinking ear, nose and throat. I'm thinking ophthalmology, um, where, you know, you cannot have the first appointment being being digital or by or by phone. Uh, Liz and I heard yesterday from in, in uh, connection with cancer services how the impact of late or wrong di wrong uh, sort of di uh, diagnosis sending people off on the wrong care pathway uh, because of lack of face to face. Uh, clinical assessment. So I can certainly see that for a significant proportion of follow-up appointments in some specialties that telephone or, dig or, or digital may provide a, 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 a flexible, uh, sort of patient-friendly way of doing it. But I would counsel strongly against the assumption that most first assessments can be done over the phone or, or or remotely. Okay, Mark. Yeah, completely agree. Um, and there's there's horses for courses, aren't there? There's there'll be some specialties where it's absolutely ideal. You know, neurology, epilepsy clinics, where we're just talking about how things have been over the last few months. That's that's exactly the right 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 place for for virtual consultations. But others, like you say, ophthalmology, you can't examine an eye here. Um, other than to say that we've got two. Um, so it's it's about how we how how we balance these things and make sure it's the right thing for the right patient. Um, and yeah, and the other bit that we're doing is sort of straight to test. So you can have a telephone conversation with somebody and say, well, you're going to need X, Y and Z, Z tests. So have those before you come and see me, um, which reduces one one appointment then. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Munro, did you have a point you wish to raise at all? You're on mute, Councillor Munro. Yes, I did have a point earlier, but I think you raised it under agenda item seven in re in relation to um, whether the current reconfiguration can cope. So um, that's the question I'm going to ask. So, but thanks very much. It's already been asked. All right. Okay. So, um, okay, that's fine then. All right then. So, if there's no more questions, then thank you uh, very much. Um, the next steps, I think we've sort of discussed next steps, haven't we? In some respects, we've got information that we uh, are, are needing from today. Uh, we've got information outstanding uh, from the previous meeting that we will look to uh, schedule in, uh, including uh, discussions with the ambulance service. And um, we also will be uh, discussing those dates whereby we need to discuss uh, business cases uh, uh, and we need uh, time to do that. Okay. All right. So if that's okay with everybody, then I think uh, we will close the meeting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Chair.